next part, which is how to treat those cities that you go to war against. And the rules may seem fairly standard, at least at first. Okay, uh, when you draw near to a city to fight against it, offer it terms of peace. Right, so the first thing you do is you offer, right, you offer it a deal. Uh, and if it accepts and surrenders, uh, okay, then all those people have surrendered to you and you can now sort of use them as forced labor. Um, and if those, if, those, if those peace offerings are, are not accepted, well, then of course you take it by force. Like none of this is new. This is kind of how war has always worked, right? If it doesn't submit peacefully, but it comes out to fight, then you besiege the city and then you kill all the men and then you take everything, right? You take the women and the children and the livestock and everything else and you have a great time with it, right? It's yours. Again, uh, we, we, you know, we might be like a little morally repulsed by it, but this really is how war has worked for most of uh, human history. It's all simple enough. Uh, but then there comes a, a caveat. Everything that we just said is about war against towns that are far from you, right? foreign nations. When you're fighting against the Canaanites, that is, the towns of those peoples that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, the Canaanites, when you're fighting against them, no terms of peace, uh, no besieging. Uh, it's total destruction, right? You shall annihilate them. Uh, this is what in Hebrew is called cherem, uh, or uh, sometimes in English, in, it's always translated badly. It's sometimes called the ban. Um, proscription is another word for this. Uh, the rules for cherem uh, are laid out in Deuteronomy 7. Maybe we'll get to them next week. But it's basically pretty clear here too. It's total annihilation. Everyone, men, women, and children, everyone is killed. No one survives. All the livestock are killed, right? So no spoils for you, right? There's, we can say plenty about the morality of this. Obviously what's being described here is quite literally genocide, especially because it even like names the peoples, right? The Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, wipe them all out, men, women, children, and all, everything they have, it's genocide. So we could talk forever about the morality. Uh, I wanna concentrate instead on the rhetoric. In the context of the story world, right? That is Moses and the Israelites, uh, on the border of the land of Moab, about to enter Canaan. In the context of the story, this is being said to the Israelites who are about to invade Canaan, uh, which makes it reasonable enough that they should be told how to treat the Canaanites that they conquer. But for literally everyone thereafter, and certainly for the Israelites reading this text at the time of its composition, which is to say, sometime in the seventh century uh, BCE, for the Israelites reading this text, what is, what is this doing here? Right? There are no Canaanites anymore. Right? There's, they're never going to fight anyone this way. And now that once we're thinking about it, the same is true of the rationale we saw back in Deuteronomy 12 for the centralization of the cult. We don't want you to worship, right? don't worship like the Canaanites around you. Well, that's really only a worry when there are Canaanites around to emulate, to intermarry with, right? All the things that the text is constantly warning about. In other words, every time it refers to Canaanites, it just doesn't speak to the reality of the time when the text was written. This whole harem thing, is this like a relic of the past? Is it like a, like a, bit, like a history lesson uh, with, no, with, with no contemporary relevance? or I suppose to put it in a more productive way. When Deuteronomy talks about the Canaanites, who is it really talking about? 